a little minute there just in case I was going to start talking before everybody uh, arrives. Um, I'm assuming that um, you can see me and hear me, which would be a, a good start. Um, I've got um, uh, uh, a couple of people behind the scenes helping me today, uh, uh, Liam and um, and Jonathan, hopefully, but at least uh, Liam will be sort of uh, pulling some levers if everything goes badly and, and giving me some feedback as well, which is, is well deserved for me. Uh, so thanks to, to Liam and Jonathan for that. Uh, I see in the chat that you can hear me, so that's good. Uh, so uh, welcome to this um, kind of uh, seat of my pants style uh, workshop on building a Raspberry Pi based um, robot arm. Uh, we're going to be driving that with .NET 5 and Blazor and Signal R by the end of this. Um, so there's actually a, a, a GitHub repo that you can go to if you want to follow along. Uh, so there's a uh, if you go if you look at the top of the screen um, on here, and then so if you go to my GitHub and you just do a search for RPI robot, then you'll go to that, and then you can go to the workshop then, and you can catch up there, uh, and then there's a bit of an introduction. Uh, just telling you pretty much just what I've told you uh, a couple of seconds ago. And essentially what we're going to be doing is uh, building the code to be able to drive this. So we have a uh, 3D printed, um, in my case, uh, robot arm. with It's actually got three servos in it, but we're only going to be driving two of them today. So we've got a servo here on these um, little, this little claw action pincer. And then another servo down here, which drives the, the arm forwards and backwards. Um, the servos are being driven by a little uh, driver board down here, which is um, made by a company called Monk Makes. Uh, so it's quite an, uh, a cheap, affordable little um, board. It saves you having to worry about the power. I've got batteries uh, plugged into that board, and then you're going to be able to drive the servos without needing to worry about you know, drawing too much current out of the pie. Um, but... On our way to that, we'll explore how to get started with the GPIO uh, on the Raspberry Pi. So I've got a little uh, breadboard down here with an LED and a button as well. So we'll flash that um, as we go, flash the LED, and then I'll be able to push the button and, and we'll make the LED flash as well. And then we'll work our way through uh, to the finished solution, um, hopefully in sort of relatively um, easy to digest chunks. Um, so, yeah, so we'll get going there's some uh, prerequisites if if you are following along and you, you might not necessarily be following along um uh, as i do it live you, you might be watching this back later but if you if you do go to the to the workshop then there's a table of contents here uh, but under the table of contents is uh, a heap of um items you can go and buy uh, i've chosen uh, the pie hut but uh, pie maroni are just a, just as good so use either of those two companies absolutely but um, I've linked to all of the products that that I've used um, to, to build this up uh, including wires and LEDs and resistors and some buttons and the breadboard and uh, then at the bottom there's the uh, the Thingiverse link to the 3D printed robot arm um, it actually works quite well I mean I've got an Ender 3 Pro and it took I don't know 30 hours in total to print all the little bits with me faffing and getting it right um, it's, it's not too bad um, but I mean, should you want to, let's see if I can get this to uh, to appear. You can actually build it in uh, cardboard if you wanted to. Oh, it's quite difficult to get that to appear in shop without like short circuiting everything. I don't know if you can see see that now. You just see the bottom of it. But I've built a, um, a a cardboard version of that same robot arm there that you could drive using the same methodology, uh, just out of uh, the Amazon packets that. Uh, that it came in so um, not too bad really I uh, see there's there's some links oh there's, there's Mert here somewhere as well um, awesome oh yeah there he is awesome thanks for joining Mert um, you'll have seen uh, little bits of some of this Mert uh, the, the the basic GPIO stuff already uh, in fact what I can do is I'm going to paste a link to the workshop in the chat uh, wonders of modern technology so you can go to that workshop and you can follow along in there if you like now um, I'm going to be sort of um, uh, copying and pasting. I'm not going to sit there and type every line out because really this is this is about the concepts as much as it is about sort of Twitch and live streaming. 
Uh, but I only finished writing the these instructions about an hour ago. So uh, in true Twitch style, I'll probably end up live debugging uh, problems with my code. Uh, but I did I did run it through and, and everything worked all the way through once at least. So that's not too bad. Uh, the, the robot arm that I'm talking about, I'll put a link for that in the chat too. Um, uh, this is actually V1 of this robot arm, but V2 of this particular robot arm that this easy robot arm guys made. Um, Dip needs more uh, higher power servos, um, and I didn't have them, so and they're more expensive and, and all sorts of reasons. So, but um, it was actually reasonably easy to build. I had a, a heap of nuts and bolts and screws hanging around, so I was lucky enough I didn't have to go and buy all of that. But um, you, you'll find in the instructions if I switch across to here again, then we all know what I'm talking about. So this is the uh, 3D printed robot arm, um, pretty much exactly the same as what I've got on the on the desk. Aside from I've not wired up this servo at the bottom down here because um, I didn't think I needed it really. Uh, it seems to work just fine without it. Um, and then there's some instructables uh, links just there, and then that shows you if you scroll past some of this. There's actually some videos of of the guy testing it. But a bit further down, there's the individual instructions on how to put this thing together. So um, I'm pretty sure that um, Cliff was uh, printing this. I'm not quite sure whether he did or not. Hey, hey, Gregor. Hey, Johnny. How's it going? Thanks for joining in. Uh, I don't know if, if Cliff, if you're even there or, or if you're 40,000 feet up in the air or something. But um, if you're uh, if you are joining along, then you can go to that instructables link and build your arm. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I've already built mine. So, I mean, it would have been hours and hours if I was going to try and build all of this lot up live on the Twitch stream. So I thought I'd just concentrate on, on the code and, and dive into that. So you could just get your servos and plug them in and I'll show you the circuit, uh, how to wire that up and just get them moving. And obviously once you've got that whole part moving, it's just a case, <laughs> just a case of assembling your, your robot arm and you're off and running. Um, it works quite well, this this robot arm does, actually. It's not bad. bit rickety. Try and go a bit too far forward, then I think it needs a screw in the base there to stop it from falling over. You may have seen a couple of things in, on Facebook about that, but I've, I've screwed it to the box that the driver board came into to, to help it a little bit there. But either way, that's that. Um, the, the, the first few steps of this experience is actually on my blog here. Uh, getting .NET 5 installed and then doing a Hello World project and then uh, sorting out GPIO and, and uh, flashing an LED and reading a button and stuff. So um, there's a bit more of a sort of a pictorial rather than a GitHub um, experience if you want that. And I'll paste that link in there too. Um, but I'm not going to spend too long on this particular page because uh, I'm going to do it sort of step by step as the workshop goes and that'll be a way of testing it as well. So I guess uh, it's probably about time to actually start coding because we're already, what, eight minutes in and I've not produced a single line of code yet. So um, the first thing uh, you need to do, though, on your Pi is dial into it somehow. Now, I've VNC'd into my Pi here, uh, but if you've just installed Raspbian on there, VNC isn't default. Uh, you'll have to turn that on. So you'll have to hook it up to a monitor at some point and turn that on. But I've done that step, but the other thing you you're going to need to do is enable SSH so that you can terminal into your Raspberry Pi and then we can run commands that way. So to do that, you just go to preferences and then Raspberry Pi configuration. And then you can go to interfaces here and then SSH is enabled in there. Now, I, I usually just enable a bunch of stuff while I'm in there, including like VNC that's already enabled. Um, so I recommend you just you do that and and then pretty much everything you need is going to be enabled. There is another step that we need to do in a little minute, uh, but I'll go through that in a second. Uh, but um, essentially, that that's the end of VNC. You don't need that once you've done that, uh, because everything else you'll do uh, with PuTTY or any other terminal session you want to use. So the uh, the next step on there is that we need to create... Um, well, we don't need to, but I like to edit my code in VS Code on my main machine. So I create a, a Samba share on my um, Pi, and there's there's a, a few different uh, places you can go to that, and I'll paste the link to, to one of them in the chat. Um, so uh, when you go through that, and I might as well click on it, and you can see uh, this is from the Magpie magazine, so it's it's you know something you can trust. It's three years ago, 
um you you install samba and then you create a share and then you edit the the samba configuration and you tell it where the share is going to be this particular one defaults to sort of in the root and then a share directory there and that's what i followed but sometimes it's better to have that in the pi directory but it's really just a case of changing that path line uh, to make that work um i'm just gonna make sure that i've got zoom it installed and then we'll be able to see this a little bit easier uh, and then you do a bunch of restarts and stuff like that but uh, the link's in there so you can go and uh oh, where's my santa hat gregor's asking well i mean uh i have sort of tried to be a little bit Christmassy, look gregor so i've made myself a background with uh, uh you've got a little bit and bot there look so um it's not too bad it's it's not as it's not as good i, I, I didn't run out of time because i was too busy writing my instructions for this still uh what i wanted was uh the festive tech calendar above me as well um so it kind of feels like half a job, but I tried. I've done a little bit. <laughs> I nearly got my uh, daughter's little uh, Christmas bunny ears, but um, uh, I think she would have shouted at me. <laughs> Kudos, Pete from Gregor. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I kind of, I tried. Um, I think uh, this should all be royalty free as well. Um, I mean, so long as you use uh, Bit and Bot for for um, sort of community work, and um, you're not going to make a profit out of it, then it's perfectly fine. And this is a um uh, a royalty free background that i found on on the internet and use that so uh yeah so you need to create a samba share the next thing after you do that is to install dotnet 5 now i've created a single line install script for for dotnet 5 to install that so i'm going to paste that in the in the chat as well um and when you do that there is a if i zoom in there i've just made a little gif um, it doesn't take long, uh, and if you use a Raspberry Pi 4, you know, you're talking about, I don't know, less, way less than a minute to get it to do that. And at the end, it'll run a .NET dash dash info, and it'll it'll tell you what it's installed. So uh, if I come back out of that Zoom. Oh, I'm uh, not sharing the right screen. Somebody ought to uh, shout at me when I'm doing that. Uh, uh, that would help, wouldn't it? Let me just say, show you that again, look. So there's a little uh, GIF that I've made here of... Um, uh, of it installing there's not much to it uh there's there's about i don't know six steps but if you're sort of a noob or you know, not particularly au fait with linux i found that people might get a bit confused and plus who wants to you know who wants to go through six or seven steps of stuff when you can just run one line of code um certainly not me because i'm very lazy uh so if i uh i've got two command prompts open here uh, this is actually a putty session so if you don't know what putty is it's a, it's a terminal emulator that allows you to be able to dial in uh using ssh into the uh, into the raspberry pi for instance or any linux box um but if i do a, a dot net dash dash oop, dash dash info here oh, dash dash info would help i'm just going to minimize this so it removes a little bit of the clutter around it so um if I now zoom in a little bit, then we should be able to see that here we've got version 5.0.100. I'm not sure that's the absolute latest, actually. I've got a feeling there might be a 2.0.0 version of that now. Um, so normally when I show this, I've got like 17 different versions of different frameworks installed, but I kind of cleared it all out to make sure that I wasn't going to have any problems while I was doing it. Uh, but essentially, if you run that uh, wget command, then uh, you'll find that uh, you'll have um, it installed and you'll be off and running at that point so so that's all good uh, we can live with that so the first thing i want to do is create just a basic console app so don't forget this is on the pi we're looking at here uh, in a in an ssh session um, and i wobbled the screen and it, it got rid of my chat and all that lot so obviously do shout in the chat if if things aren't big enough or or if you've got any questions or i've done something blatantly wrong or whatever but i mean if my robot arm is moving at the end of this i don't care what i've done wrong because it works <laughs> this really isn't a, a, a sort of a production this is what you should be doing in the chat uh johnny thank you very much that's good uh feedback as much as you want you know if i'm not loud enough or if i'm going too fast or just blethering then tell me but the first thing i want to do is uh, create a, a console app so dot net uh, new console and i'm going to stick that in rpi robot and we're going to build on this same console app all the way through um so check slack i always check slack as i go yeah absolutely i see there's a notification down there uh-huh 
and your audio is only coming out of the left channel. Um, yeah, all right, that's a really good point. And in fact, I notice when I'm recording in Audacity that that happens. So uh, if I, I'm assuming I can do that somewhere, well, what, in filters maybe or something? Uh, how do I do that? Is there any, any Twitch, any um, OBS experts out there that can tell me how to mix to mono? I'm not entirely sure how you do that. Set OBS advanced audio. Ah, okay. Settings. Uh, audio. Advanced. Oh, well, there's nothing it's telling me in there very, very helpful. Sounds fine. Greg, Greg will reckon it's fine. O OBS, ad advanced audio. So I mean, I mean, oh, advanced and then audio, is it? Maybe that's what it is. Nope. I don't see it in there. It would be nice if uh, people didn't have to listen out of the left ear the whole way through because um, that's going to annoy somebody. It'd probably annoy me if I was listening to it. Uh, it sounds fine. So just Liam then. Interesting. I wonder why that would be then. Uh, has everybody else got headphones on? Are you getting it out of both channels in the headphones? Sounds fine. Plus one from Mert as well. It's just maybe you've gone deaf in an ear, Liam. <laughs> I don't know. I'll carry on for now. Um, if somebody wants to sort of, uh, I know Mert, you've said I, I can't see that setting in um, in audio or advanced audio. So um, I don't know where that is. Uh, if you want to like paste a, a link in the chat or something along those lines, whatever you can do to do that. But oh, Johnny, yeah, you're, Johnny, you're listening on the TV. Maybe other people are. Oh, we've pasted a screenshot in Slack. Uh, ah, good man. Appreciate it. Let's have a look. Oh, there. Ah, all right. Well, he's, there you are, you see. See, it takes an expert. So, here. Advanced audio properties. Mono. That. Right, is that coming out of both now? Uh, I suppose I'm specifically asking uh, Liam, but Jonathan, if you're listening as well. Oh, fixed it. Ah, there we are. Oh, thank you very much. You see, this is what uh, having good friends is all about. Thank you very much for that. That's good. So um, I'm hovering around here. So I'm going to create a, a console app, just a simple console app. And we're going to then um, work our way through this console app, putting in stuff and taking it back out again on a regular occasion to be able to test the little bits of stuff that I've got hanging around um, down on my rig down here. Uh, just, just there. So all of this lot. So what I want to do first is flash this, this LED that I'm pointing to. That would be um, the boom now onto the robot. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry about that. What you didn't want to do is come here and watch me debug um, OBS and Twitch, is it? So, uh, right. So back on here, I am going to create this new console app, RPI Robot. Let it finish doing that. Now this is pretty quick on a Raspberry Pi four. It's not bad, but I don't recommend you do this. Uh, going forward, there's I've got all sorts of tutorials and there's a, an extension for VS Code that sort of lets you do this too, uh, where you do all of your building and your creating on your um, on your, your machine, My Surface Book 3 in this particular case, and then you just push down the published files uh, onto the Pi and you run them and you can debug that way as well. But that that's just too much superfluous stuff to do for this. Uh, if I look now, I've got this uh, RPI robot um, and I can do a .NET run and just make sure that everything's working so i mean this is the uh and it literally is it will say hello world when we've done this and and i know for for a lot of you watching the stream that this will be boggy basic stuff but i mean just getting net running on a pi is pretty cool all on its own um you've now got the facility to take your c sharp skills and 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 do some iot coolness uh, remind myself to drink so and uh, that's that little bit. Now, as I said, I set up a share on my Pi. So uh, this is what I did there. So I just sort of minimize these out of the way and make life a bit easier. Then I've actually mapped that share to a, um, uh, um, a, a drive here. And then I've got this festive tech folder. And in there, I've got my RPI robot folder. I mean, this this is sort of a halfway house to... Um, and, and I know that's probably, I can't do it any other way, actually. I can zoom in with this. So you should be able to see the files there for the uh, for our little application our project. So there's not much to it at the moment. It's a CS proj and a, a program.cs. 
but I can open that in code. And zoom in a little bit. And in here we've got just a bit of code to say hello world. So there's, there's not actually that much to it. Um, and that's not all that interesting at the minute either. So um, what we really want to do um, is if we go to the next piece of code, I'm going to um, show you quickly the, the circuit actually before I do that. So go back to my workshop and we go to the circuit. So we've done we've done steps one, two, three, and four there, but this is the circuit we're going to be building. Now I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, so we have got the Raspberry Pi at the top, and then this is the uh, uh, the little breadboard that I've got connected there. Uh, I've got the instructions on what pin gets connected to what, and you'll see those in in the instructions there. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, but you can count pins around well, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, like that. We'll be using what's called the board numbering scheme, which I'll go into in a little bit. And then here's that monk's make uh, monk makes servo driving board and the battery pack connected to it. And then I've got three servos connected in here. And um, if we get sort of on fast enough, then I'll show you why I'm only really looking at two. Um, so if I zoom back out again, down here is the pinout of the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you don't know what GPIO is, it's General Purpose Input Output, and it's the facility to be able to drive LEDs and read buttons, but there's also things like serial ports on there uh, and PWM, which is really important because these servos, as they're called, they're kind of like mini motors, and their their angle of their positioning is driven by PWM and, and what um, uh, uh, how, how much on and off that you get. Um, determines where that is, that frequency in there. So um, we've got a bunch of stuff connected up. So here's the um, the LED and button circuit that we've got. So the pin numbers, as you can see up here, look, they go one, two, three, four, five, six from the inside out. So uh, even numbers on the top row here. So in one, two, three, four, five, six, that, that black one there should be ground, six ground. So that kind of gives you an idea of how that's connected. So six, eight, and then 10. So on pin 10 there, we're controlling the LED. And then down here on 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, we've got one side of the button and then denoted by a black wire, it's gone down to ground again. So we're going to be using pins 10 and 26. Uh, so I've got um, the, the basics of what to connect up there, look. So pin 26 and pin 25 for ground and pin 10 for the uh, uh, for the resistor that's driving the LED there and then pin six. So hopefully that's okay. And you understand that. Um, again, I did I did consider building this. And I, I mean, to be fair, the, you know, the, the circuit isn't all that complicated. So I, I could have built that uh, if I wanted to uh, live, but I didn't want to sit there and be twisting the LED round the right way round because I can never remember which way round it goes. Um, but uh, I thought, again, I thought I'd concentrate on the code. So the next step we, we want to do is this is flashing the LED. Now there's not much to it, but the thing we need to do is add this uh, device.gpio package, this NuGet package that allows the .NET code then to interface with the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. So just looking at my Slack, just keeping up with that. You can do with zooming in a bit on your windows. Um, when did you send that? 5.50. Oh, okay. So I've zoomed in a bit more. Uh, hopefully that yeah, might be even better now. Yeah, it probably is. So thanks, Liam. Appreciate that. Uh, so I am going to go back to my putty window. Um, I might just up the font size on that to um, something a little bit bigger. Let's go with 22. That, that might be, uh, and that looks better on the on the monitor down here. So that might be a little bit better. So we've got Hello World. That's working. Let's add that package, .NET add package system.device.gpio. And that's just going to grab the latest one. So that's there. And now if I flick back to my, um, uh, my little program from earlier and go to the, the CS proj, then we'll see we've now got that uh, NuGet package referenced and included. So... Next up, we want to actually write some code to do that. And we're going to have to add a using at the top here for using, oh, and then system.device.g. 
GPIO. I'll add one of those. And then under this, and I'm not going to sit and write this code because that would be incredibly boring to watch. So I have some code in good, uh, well, if you're from the UK, then you'll know Blue Peter. I will have created that earlier. So let me just grab the code for that and then I'll just explain what it's doing. You'll see whatever I do, I tend to leave this this hello world in there because if you don't leave that in there and, and say nothing is coming out of the terminal, as in this case, then if it doesn't light the LED, you're kind of doubting whether it's running or not. Um, so I always leave that in. <clears throat> and that'll be a common theme in what I do here. So first thing we do is create this GPIO controller uh, called controller. And we pass in this pin numbering scheme, this this board pin numbering scheme. And if I flick back to and uh, go back by a step, then again, and zoom out a little bit, then uh, you'll see that there's two different sets of numbers that you can see on here. And the one we're referring to is the board numbering scheme because it's the, the pins on the board. But there's also this BCM numbering scheme here. And that refers to the actual chip uh, on the Pi that deals with GPIO. Uh, so there's two different ways. And .NET will support either of those, depending on what your fascination is. Uh, but I stick with the, the board numbering scheme. So otherwise, if someone says it's BCM14, then you've got to find this diagram. And then, oh, right, it's pin 8. So just personally, just stick to the board numbering scheme, and then it's far easier to, to deal with this, uh, unless you've got a very good reason not to. So we've done that, we've created this controller object here. Um, then we're going to create a couple of variables. We're going to create a pin and we're going to assign that to 10. And again, if I go forwards back on this again, oh no, down in fact, then if you remember, look, we've got the resistor connected to pin 10. We're, we're going to drive this LED on through pin 10 on the Raspberry Pi. So that's what that is going to give us. And then we've got a light time. So all this is, is we're going to do a thread dot sleep a little bit further down here. And in between turning the LED on and off, we're just going to pause for a second. Otherwise, it's just going to be permanently on. Do you have a favorite GPIO pins? I just pick them at random ones. Um, I, I pick these ones because I've kind of stuck with these all the way through for all of my... Because um, uh, I've sort of started writing code for, for Azure with the Pi. Uh, and I did all that in Node. Um, so uh, I kind of just have everything all wired up already. And so when I moved to C Sharp and .NET, uh, core 3.1 or whatever it was, then it was already wired up that way. So when I moved to .NET 5, exactly the same reason. It's pure laziness. That's all it is. <laughs> uh, but the the other thing is that, um, as I mentioned before, it's worth worth noting. As I say, these have dual functions. So this is um, SPI, this MOSI and MOSO and S clock there, which is a serial interface, and there's a couple of them, I think. Um, on here so uh, so you've got dual functions for some of these so i tend to kind of come up here and and, and use something that i'm used to using so um what is it pin 10 over here so that's the actual uart so i wouldn't be able to use the uart if i was driving an led for instance there are ones that would be better 16 and 18 for instance um so just worth worth bearing that in mind but obviously for for this particular example i don't need a uart uh, so I'm fine with where I am, and I haven't in the past, but yeah, worth bearing that one in mind. So over here then, we've got, um, the next line we've got here is just open the pin, and we open it as a pin mode output. You'll see in the in the next example where we're, we're reading the button, we'll have a pin mode input. It makes sense. A little bit more to it than that. Uh, and then we've got a while loop, so literally just going to go round in a circle here, and we're going to set this pin to be high, and then we're going to wait for that 300, that's in milliseconds, Thread dot sleep, just in case you don't know your thread dot sleeps, uh, and then set it low, and then set it uh, rather set it low, and then wait again, and then at the end we're, here we've got this close pin. Uh, so if we crash, then we know we're going to release that pin because when you assign a pin and open it, then it becomes bound, and and if you try and do something else with it, you can't. So um, worth bearing that in mind. So I was <laughs> I do this and then I forget to save it. Uh, so uh, but you'll see here what happens is when you do try and save it. It says that it's failed. Now, what happens when you do a .NET new is that it doesn't give all the necessary permissions to all of the files. So you need to do a chmod on that whole directory. So you can do chmod uh, dash r to do recursive, then 777, and then rpi robot. Oh, no, let's do it that the right way around, shall we? 777 dash r. Oh, is it the end? Oh, 
Oh, there we are. Uh, this would help, wouldn't it? RPI robot uh, 777-R. That way round. If you were, oh, come on. What's going on here now? CH mod 777, that's right. 777 RPI robot dash R. No such file as 777. What's going on with it? Oh, it's because I've got a slash after it. Whoops. Uh, that's annoying, isn't it? Ah! 777. <laughs> How many times did I have to type that in? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get if you type if you use the tab key. Um, if you're working locally on the Pi, you'd still hit the same issue. Pete goes, um, not sure actually. Um, possibly, I want to say, yeah, seven seven seven. Yeah, oh geez, sorry about that. Uh, but this is Twitch; it's live. It's supposed to have things going on like that. Uh, I don't remember it doing that uh, forward slash before. That's why it threw me. But either way, uh, don't click this retires admin. That's not going to help. And so don't do not do any of those things. And then just save it again and you'll find it will save. So that's just something you're just going to have to bear in mind. You only have to do that once per directory, per project. Um, so, yeah, nothing too onerous there. But it just sort of explains that if you've not seen that before. So now I need to go back into my RPI robot directory and I can do a .NET run. But before I do that, I am going to switch to this one. And um, I've kind of left this zoomed out a little bit so you can see the arm and what I've got. But you should be able to see the LED run. If I do dot that run here. That's tiny little me sitting on the desk. <laughs> oh, now I've broken it. Uh, oh. Yeah, what I haven't done is added threading to my... Um, hang on, look. I've got an error. Live coding. I forgot to add system dot um, threading into my application there. That's what you get for not copying and pasting your own code. Is it threading? Threading? Something like that? System dot threading? I think it is. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. Have some, uh, have some faith, Pete. Let's try that again now. I should have like fixed that with nobody, nobody seeing and just pretended it was taking ages to build. Hello world, and we should have a flashing LED. Now, I've got um, uh, my phone set up with a, an application called IPCAM. Um, and what that does is it broadcasts uh, the camera on, on the phone as a web page. It's quite handy, actually. And then in OBS, I've just hooked up um, a browser uh, panel, I forget what it's called now, but either way that, um, to that address in the video portion. So that's, that's how I'm able to get the video out. But... Uh, you might find that that LED looks like it's flashing in a really odd pattern. It really isn't. Um, it's I can see it flashing here, and it's nice and nice and stable. It's just you've got Chinese whispers going on. So, so that's that. So that's that flashing happily enough. Um, and if I then switch back here, I can stop that code. Uh, so I mean that is essentially hello world for um, uh, for uh, IoT projects, <laughs> flashing an LED. Uh, but that only gets you so far, really, you need to be reading inputs as well. So we'll do that one next, actually. <coughs> so, yeah, as I say, we've got a little button on, on the board here. <coughs> Excuse me. So I am going to be uh, removing a bunch of this code and then replacing it with some more. So let's just delete that piece of code there. And I am going to replace it with some code that reads the button and just quickly explain what that does. It's annoying when you paste and it's not tabbed, and I can't handle that. I could have just left it, but I can't handle it. Uh, so exactly the same thing as before. We've got the GPIO controller, and uh, we've got a pin. We've lost our delay, because we don't need one uh, for what we're doing. And we've now got a button pin. And again, if you remember back, um, we have got our button connected here on pin 26. Um, so that is what we have specified here for that pin. So we've got... A pin open output here for the LED again, but we've got an input pull up pin here for the button pin. Now, um, if you didn't have the facility to do this pulling up, what you'd have to do is put a resistor on the board that pulled one side of the pin, either low or high, depending on what your electronics are giving you. 
um, in in this particular case, I'd pull it high, and then when you press the button, it would then take it low. Um, what this does do, though, is makes the logic a little bit backwards, because while you're not pressing the button, you're reading a high value, a true value from that pin. And when you do press it, you read a false. So we've got a loop down here, um, and I'm reading, just here, the button pin. And if the button pin is false, then I set the LED to be on high, as that case is. So it sounds a bit backwards, um, but that's just how the electronics is working. And if it's not false, so in other words, it's true, so in other words, it's high, it's been pulled up internally by the Raspberry Pi, then I set the LED to be off. And again, I just, I'm just closing that, that LED pin there. I should probably also close the, the button pin, but, uh, you know, this is a demo. So I've saved that. You saw I didn't need to um, uh, uh, do any more CH modding or anything like that. Um, so that was good. So if I switch back to my application again now and run that again. And then over here, switch back to this. Make sure this is still working. Yeah, okay. Hello. So that is actually running now, but you wouldn't know, which is, again, that's the reason why I leave that hello world on there um, so that I know that something's happened. At least it's, it's run and it's stopped and it's not crashed or, you know, got caught in some weird loop or whatever. <clears throat> so if I now come down here and press the button, then that's the most complicated way that you could possibly wire a button straight to an LED all the way through, you know, 30 quid's worth of Raspberry Pi. Um, but that's good now. We've 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 sort of made a loop there, so we can read uh, the button input, and we can then set the state of the LED. So that that sort of just um, gets it to the point where you've got some confidence in what it is you're doing. So um, buttons red, but you're not here to see uh, buttons being pressed and an LEDs being lit. You're here to see this bit move, um, which is kind of what you want. Uh, to happen so if I switch back now to here and we go on just to the next step and again we can press, scroll past this because we've already flashed the LED that was the end. that's what it would look like by the way um, uh, if you were to uh, run it and see it in real life that's kind of what it looks like show us the robotics absolutely absolutely uh, then we read a button, and again, I've got all of the explanation in this uh, workshop instructions here. So, uh, if anything's not clear, then go and read that. And uh, if anything's still not clear, then well, it's um, public on on GitHub. So go and make a pull request and make it better. You are more than welcome. I'm more than more than open to pull requests. It's always a good thing to have. So now we would go and um, this is. Um, building, look at that, I've not changed the title there, that should say building the circuit to servos. Um, so there, someone can make a pull request and fix that for me if you like. Uh, there's a reminder of the, the overall circuit again here, of what, what we're going to do, and then a reminder of the GPIO because you're going to be plugging stuff in. And the next step is to, um, down here, if I switch back to this view again, this uh, little monk makes board. You've got servos connected on one side, and then you've got the Raspberry Pi connected through some wires down here on the other side. Um, and there's like a horrible lag every now and again on, on this um, uh, uh, IP cam. I'm not quite sure what it's playing at. Uh, it's just being annoying, I think, because it knows I'm live streaming. Uh, but either way, you've got a bunch of these pins all connected together, and I've got the pins uh, listed here, what to connect from the Raspberry Pi to the servo board but what I found when I did this is that this didn't look particularly clear to me because I always start at this side bearing in mind it would be the other way up and actually this pin here this first pin is ground but it didn't it didn't seem particularly obvious that ch if if I was you Mr Monk I'd put I'd put it underneath there and just sort of point at that as ch and put ground here uh, because I, when I wired it up the first time I thought that was pin one and, and I went with that and it was it didn't work and I wondered why and it was it was me not reading the eh, slightly distracting uh, labels there, uh, but you can see that I've got um, channel one here, down here connected to pin thirty five. If I go up here, then you'll see on pin thirty five, it's actually pin thirty three. Look, not pin thirty five. That's interesting. That should read thirty three. Another pull request, please. It's thirty three. I've got it connected to, not thirty five. And that's PWM one. 
And then I've got another one here uh, connected up to two, four, six, eight, ten. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Uh, no, you see, that should be 12 there. So I've got a couple of bugs in my circuit diagram here. Um, but can you explain why you have batteries for one and your power? Ah, okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the raspberry, these these are basically mot motors, these servos here. And when you it's mainly when you first start to move them, they draw quite a lot of current. And the Raspberry Pi is plugged into a power supply, and it can take, you know, uh, some power... But if you start drawing too much power out of your Raspberry Pi pins, you can actually blow the pin. And if it stalls when it's starting, uh, then that's really bad. So what you don't want to do is be be driving the actual power to the servos directly. Now, I will, we'll look at servos in a second down here, look. And in fact, we'll go down. So there's actually three pins to a servo. There's a control pin, and that's on this C pin here on the other side of that Monk Makes board. And then there's a plus and a minus, and that's where the power is coming from. Now, what this board does is it splits off the power and just leaves the control pins connected to this circuit diagram. I'll double check this circuit diagram because I'm not quite sure if that's that's right according to the GPIO because that should be on uh, PWM0 there on pin 12. But I think I've got it connected to pin 10 on there. Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. No, it is pin 12. Ugh, doubting myself. Pin 12, not PWM0. Um, so, so that yeah, that's that. So... If you have the battery pack connected to that Monk Makes board, then it's going to just give it... I mean, I've got four batteries in there, so that's six volts or there or thereabouts. <laughs> and as much current as the batteries can give, which is kind of their job. Um, so, yeah, that, that's relatively easy at that point. And, and again, you can see the, the full circuit at the top here. Right? The battery's connected to that. I've not written the step on connecting the batteries because, I mean, come on. <laughs> put the red one where it says plus <laughs> uh, so with that wired up which is what I've got so I've got three servos shown on here and again I'll, if I get time I'll show you why I'm only doing two uh, but um, one of the reasons is there's only there's only two PWM ports zero and one and we'll come to them in a minute when we look at the code so that's wired up so what we want to do now is just make some demo code just to make sure that we've got that all wired up correctly and we can move the... Um, oh, I mean, I was... Ugh. You're showing your desktop, Pete. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I was a bit late looking at the thing. Look, look let me do that again. Servos. Um, here's the... Sorry. Here's those three wires I was I was I was alluding to without you being able to see. There's a yellow one. Actually, it's orange on servos. Um, but I wanted to match what the servo was that you can get out of fritzing. Uh, so yellow is control, and then you've got red and black, which are the power. Um, and again, here's the here's that full circuit. So sorry about that. Oh, look, I, th I think um, uh, in, the, in the chat, I think it's possible that my uh, um, family are watching this in the other room. So that's uh, that Pete codes there isn't me. It's um, not my alter ego. That'd be my, my eldest daughter. So hi, hi, Isla. Ah, <coughs> oh, thank you, Johnny. Well... I I can pretty much guarantee that everybody that's watching this and commenting in there is also awesome. Uh, so and again, thank you all for for coming and tuning into this. Uh, me me blabbering on about <laughs> what it is I'm doing. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, Everoth, yeah, thank you. Oh, that's really nice of you. Uh, if you're showing something on the screen, by the way, uh, you couldn't see it a moment ago. Yeah, thanks, Liam. <laughs> Apologies for that. Uh, so yeah, moving the servos is the next thing we want to do. I I, I want to. What I'm going to do is, uh, and I won't forget to turn this back off again, but I'm going to get this robot arm to go forwards and backwards and also get these pincers to pince in and out. Uh, there is, again, there is one in the base, a servo in the base that can rotate it, uh, but I'm not going to do anything with that because it's silly. So back here again. Um, I've got a, a bunch of code, but one of the first things we need to do is add this IoT device bindings. Now, um, some some really clever people at Microsoft and beyond have created a bunch of what's called device bindings for a whole heap of IoT devices that you can drive uh, from .NET, and, and I mean a whole heap. So this is um, just a sm like the list, and I'm going to scroll through relatively fast here um, of all the different chips, and there's, there's things like IO expanders, that's what that MCP chip is there. Um, there's LED matrix matrices, the Sense Hat, 
Uh, if you've not seen a sense hat before, I've actually got one, but I don't want to move my green screen, so probably you'll fall on my head. Uh, that is a little hat that you can, and the hat is uh, hardware attached on top. It's a little uh, add-on board that you can plug in to the top of the Raspberry Pi. And if you've ever seen a micro bit before, it's a bit like that. It's got a matrix of LEDs on it and some uh, sensors, temperature sensors and uh, humidity sensors and gyroscopes and magnetometers and things like that. And uh, what's cool about that is that uh, they uh, over at Raspberry Pi, they made a toughened case and they put a Raspberry Pi and a, and a sense hat in it and made something called the Astro Pi project. And when Tim Peake went up to the space station on his uh, supply run that went before him, two Raspberry Pis went up there with this sense hat on there. And there's a, there's a project, the Astro Pi project, and kids and young adults can make uh, experiments that will run on the space station and then they'll get those results back in the classroom. It's a really cool piece of kit. I, I, if you've not seen it before, go and check that out. It's really cool. Uh, you mentioned space to anybody, you know, least of all me, then it's, it's uh, something that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. So then Jonathan says, I'm representing the T over in Slack. So... Um, yeah, uh, this is thanks to, uh, to to Liam for for buying me this as well. It's like a really early um, get on brand Christmas present, so yeah, it's all good. Uh, so I mean, yeah, there's a list of all of the different types of sensors down here, and if you go into them, then it'll give you a bit more detail. Now, um, if I do, uh, you could do a search in there if you wanted to, but there's one for servos. Uh, that we're going to use in a, in, in a little bit. But this is all part of these device bindings. And the great thing is when you go into each of these individual directories, there's uh, all the instructions on how to use it, including a bunch of examples as well. So it's well worth having just a trial around this and you can get some really good um, ideas about what you can do. I mean, I think there's it's, it keeps being modified this 29 days ago, in fact, this one. I think they updated this um, just as much for .NET 5 as anything at one point. So um, servo motors, but what we need to do is pull in this uh, this NuGet package. And you do that by, and if we flick back to, uh, to here in fact, where are we? To here. Then we've got this uh, .NET add package IoT device binding. So we'll add that to our project. There we are. I see um, we've been going for, what, 50 minutes so far, and we're just about to start moving the, the robot arm. Uh, so that's added that uh, particular thing to it. Now, um, we need to add a couple of using statements. And again, if we go on to CS project, then you can see we've now got the IoT device bindings in there as well. And I go up to the top, and we can add a couple of using statements. Uh, PWM, as I explained earlier, is how servos are actually driven. And then servo motor uh, abstracts PWM out a little bit further and then converts those those frequencies we need into angles and just makes it a little bit easier to, to deal with. So again, I'm going to delete all that code. Don't need any of that. I flick back to here and uh, copy and paste the code that I've got here and then I'll, I'll go through it. There. So... What we do is we create these PWM channels um, and we pass in um, a few parameters, uh, including um, a, a frequency and the channel number there. And in fact, I think uh, if I was doing this actually over on, huh, that's something to bear in mind. If you're editing code like this from your Raspberry Pi, for some reason it breaks in Telesense. I'm not entirely sure why that is. Um, and I've never really sort of managed to fix why that might be but there might be something i can do somewhere with with something to to fix that um and it's just another good reason for for doing all your editing on your pc rather than on the pi i guess um and then once we created that pwm channel and in fact i've actually t um, explained what these things are so we pass in the chip number so that's what that first um item is and then the pwm channel and if you remember i said we had two pwm hardware channels on the pi and then uh, the frequency, and I can't spell frequency look, just there. Um, and I kind of just copy and pasted those and uh, they worked. So don't ask me why those numbers are what they are, um, but they are. Um, next thing we do is create a servo motor and we pass in that channel into the servo motor. Again, it's, it's a, an abstraction higher. 
<clears throat> and then what we do is we we set the maximum angle uh, and these servos are called 180 degree servos so you know i don't need to explain to you what that means they can only go 180 degrees there are 360 degree servos as well uh, but you could quite easily get into a bit of problem if you keep going round and round and round uh, and then there's the um the min and the max frequency which is what those are uh, min and max uh, pulse width rather here and you might find that you have to change these two figures around a bit depending on what brand of servo you use um, because it kind of determines uh, how smooth it's going to be and the end stops as well so I kind of got these just about right with them 700 and 2400 as the pulse width and again PWM pulse width modulation so it, it changes that pulse width to, to move the uh, the servo around and I've got two of them so uh, that's what they are and then under that I actually start the two servo motors which connects the pins and uh, and starts the PWM up uh, and then I've got a while loop here and all I'm going to do is just use this move to angle um, uh, function which I've uh, not pasted in yet and then I'm going to pass in my servo motor and the angle I want it to move to and then I'm just going to wait for two seconds and then I'm going to do the same for servo two and then move again for servo one and the same for servo two so i need to go and grab that uh, move to angle and this just makes it slightly easier this makes the code slightly simpler uh, stick that underneath here uh, and all i'm doing is is taking that servo that i'm passing in uh, and calling this right angle uh, function this right angle uh, subroutine that's that's based on that and then just passing in the angle uh, anywhere between 0 and 180 theoretically but what you might find is that unless you get those pulse widths exactly right zero ends up hitting the the end stop and you can damage your servo if you're not careful you strip all the gears on the inside so i tend to steer clear of the extremes um, we've got another extreme to worry about in a bit as well with these pincers but i'll kind of show that when i'm doing it so hopefully that makes a bit of sense out of what we're doing it's quite simple the code's pretty simple at that point um and and that is a benefit of using those device bindings because um we've not had to write that code somebody else is is dealing with that code so yeah i see there's people itching now going just just run it man so uh, i'm gonna do that and with the moving of the servos ever off uh, can you control the speed too um well, they, they go as fast as they possibly can go, but you can make them go slower by, by gradually changing uh, that angle value. So if you wanted to go from, from 10 to 170, you could go in one degree steps with as much of a delay in, in between as you like. Uh, but if you went from, from, from 10 to 170, in one big go, it goes zoop, it's sort of that sort of speed. It's, it's fast uh, when you do do that, <laughs> which is not what you want to do when you've got one of the world's wobbliest rob uh, robot arms sitting in front of you. <laughs> Uh, so um, hopefully that answers the question for you, uh, Everoth. Um, so uh, I'm going to run this code up, uh, but I'm going to switch to here again now, and just I always just make sure that uh, that that works every time because every now and again this thing just goes to sleep, um, and I don't know what it's doing. So I'm going to run my code. Don't let run, and then we cross our fingers because obviously we're taking a big jump here and I've got to hope that A, my batteries haven't run out and wires haven't fallen off and that's just I'm just going to make sure that um, I'm not snagging myself here as well because uh, there's wires everywhere um, I might tilt it a little bit so you can see what it's doing a little bit better so I'm going to run that and I'm going to hold on to the base because it may fall over <laughs> Oh, here we go. There we are. So that's just going around in a little demo loop now. It's grabbed a hold of the wires, look. They're my wires. But you can see, hopefully, that um, if I just get it to focus again, you should be able to see that the uh, the arm is now going through a little demo routine of, of moving in and out and uh, gripping and not gripping might be a little bit difficult to see i'll move it a little bit closer and you might be able to see uh, it looming towards you <laughs> so i mean um that's that's great we've got surveys working and i'll stop that code now what you might find is um unless you stop these uh, surveys properly then 
uh, and I don't think that my finally code gets gets run there, judging by the fact that when I've stopped it, you can sometimes hear, and I don't know if I was just talking over the top of it, you can sometimes hear like a uh, a vibrating sound. And that's because it's it's still doing that pulse width modulation to put it in a particular position. And what it's really doing is stopping it from moving left and right by keeping it in a particular position. And if you've got something sitting on those servos trying to move them, then it can be jittering like that um, and making a buzzing sound. And if you just kind of tap the arm, then it'll stop making that sound. It's it's not too bad. But if you've got something big and heavy on these things, that, that's, that could be bad because you end up frying it. Uh, so, yeah, I see I see robots appearing then. And thank you. Well, I mean, yeah, I, that's, that's a reasonably uh, cool place to get to now. We've got the robot arm actually moving. And I mean, we could quit there now. Yeah, I'm just going to get drunk. But that wouldn't be fun. And in fact, when I first started doing this, uh, I didn't go much further with it. But I thought, yeah, you know, uh, thank you for the thank you for the bits. Oh, uh, what? Who? Um, hey. No, we're all about uh, what the, the, the this bit. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, uh, so, no, we're not going to stick there. That would be boring. Uh, so I've stopped that code, and if we go back to our set of instructions here, we'll see that the next step is to add signal R. So it's a Twitch thing. Oh, is it? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You might be right. I've got like I think it's telling me that I can claim some down here as it happens. Claim your bonus. I just got fifty somethings down here. So happy days. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm on um the the Azureish channel today. If I could even say it, I'm not even had a drink. Um, and uh, kudos to, to, to Liam and, and Jonathan. Uh, I mean, I don't think Jonathan would mind me saying mainly mainly Liam to, for getting this, this whole channel set up, and uh, Liam specifically, but all of us are trying to grow this channel, which is one of the reasons why I hopped on here uh, to do this stream on the Azure channel, because we kind of want to get to a place where it becomes like a, a television channel, a bit like the... Um, uh, the, the, the Microsoft, the Visual Studio channels and stuff like that, where they have different shows. So that's what we're doing here. So um, by all means, do try and spread this far and wide. And in fact, um, uh, Jonathan, Liam and I have got um, an upcoming Twitch stream uh, at some point. Uh, so it's well worth uh, keeping your eyes on our stream and, you know, get the notifications and, and all of that. And you'll see some other cool stuff uh, going on. Uh, I think yeah, yeah, I don't want to say too much more than that. That'd be fine. So uh, we've moved these um, uh, uh, servos around, but what we're going to do now is add a little bit of signal R goodness. So what my, what the plan is here is that we're going to create a uh, Christmas special for the Festive Tech Channel. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, we don't want to uh, announce early. Uh, there's a whole process for announcements, which everybody's been keeping up on. And, and by the way kudos to everybody involved in organizing the festive tech challenge uh, uh, calendar because it is an enormous amount of work uh, i can imagine on um, behind the scenes so um that that whole team of people uh, uh who've, who've uh, organized this event of you know thank you so much to to you to, for what you're doing for the community it's it's fantastic and i'm hoping that somebody will buy you at least a beer um if not you know leave you needing to have a lie down afterwards so yeah thank you so yeah signal r so my plan is is that i'm going to spin up in a bit a blazer app and a, a blazer wasm app a blazer wasm hosted hosted blazer wasm app um and i'm going to have a signal r hub in that blazer wasm app and i'm going to be able to move controls around to be able to move in real time the uh the the raspberry pi arm here so that, that's the plan here. So the first step in that process is to add Signal R to our app. Uh, I could have done this the other way around, but I figured we're already in this app, so let's finish off with the app for now. So we need to add the, the Signal R.client uh, NuGet package to our application. Uh, it's just... Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I can, I'm just checking Slack and chats at the same time <laughs> to keep myself up. Uh, so, right, back to this. Let's add that SignalR client NuGet package. Uh, I'll be just about done. There we are. 
So next up, we need a few more using statements. And uh, again, might as well just check. We can see there we have that signal our client uh, reference in there. So some more NuGet uh, packages. Um, normally I would put this up there just because you know, keep it neat. Um, so that just makes it slightly easier to be able to do async later. Um, essentially and this one's pulling in uh, the signal R client and this one's just for a bit of HTTP oh look oh, a bit of an announcement there from Gregor um, the uh, 12th of December there will be uh, an Azure-ish special um, and what do we have? just a Christmas special let's say that for now it's going to be fun looking forward to that so I am going to get rid of some of this code here again so again that's a common theme and then I'm above my main statement. I'm going to create this uh, signal R hub connection. So just up here, so we can use that. And this is going to be the the crux of our application. Aside from the survey stuff, we put back in again. Uh, oh, Johnny's saying can't wait to to watch that one. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, once I've got done with this one. Uh, then I need to then up my game again because I feel like I've been letting Jonathan and Liam down recently because I've been so busy that I've not been able to put in as much time as as I would have liked to have done to to get what we need to get done for that. So uh, sorry, Liam and Jonathan. Uh, but after this, then I've got that uh, back on my radar. But also uh, you'll have seen that DDD has been announced for that same day on the 12th, as it happens. Uh, and I've got a talk on this particular um, subject at, at DDD. So um, yeah, by all means, come and watch that. There's going to be more slides in that one and me explaining code and just hit and run rather than sort of live coding it. Uh, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber and you're enjoying the show, please consider uh, choosing to use our Twitch Prime benefit. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. First handful of uh, subscribers get a founder badge. Yeah, just like Everoth. Thank you, Everoth. Absolutely fantastic. So I really do wish that that water was now beer, uh, but you know, hey, hey. Uh, so now we need to change this, uh, our main to a uh, async task because we're gonna do a bit of, just a bit of async to make this run a little bit better. So we switch that out and that's why we needed this uh, threading.tasks. And then uh, I've got a bunch of, again, a bunch of code here and I'll go through the code in a second. I'll just paste it in for now. Oh, no, no, not full screen. Oh, indentation. Yeah, so um, we've got pretty much the same code here at the top where we're in, uh, creating these PWM servo motor objects. Um, so we don't need to go through that again, really. Uh, but then here we're doing a... Uh, we're, we're creating our uh, connection our uh, signal R connection here using this hub connection builder. Uh, we're passing in a URL. Now we don't have that URL at the minute, uh, but essentially this is our, our PC IP address, which is where the signal R app is going to be. And it's going to get spun up on port 5001. And we'll be creating a chat hub URL uh, for that to, to connect to. Now you can also pass in a configuration. Now what I found when I did this the first time is that it's trying to connect over HTTPS and um, it was complaining that the certificate was invalid. And I thought, well, I've seen on, on Twitter people saying you just need to reset your certificates because it's a .NET 5 thing. But that didn't work. Uh, so I searched around and managed to find this little bit. There was loads of different fixes, but this is the only one that worked for me. And we essentially just say, look, we're not bothered about these dangerous, uh, we're not bothered about these certificate validators here, but <laughs> I do, do like the fact that it's telling me that it's dangerous. Dangerous, except any service certificate validator. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I can trust my own PC here. So again, don't do this in production. Uh, fix the problem first. I'm not quite sure what it, the problem is. When you do fix it, come and make me a pull request and you can tell me you know, how that worked. Uh, and then we build that uh, hub connection out of that. Then a little bit further down, we have our connection and we're using this on method here. And uh, in there, we're going to wait for uh, two strings and the receive message um, message essentially. And we're, we're gonna be passing in from our Blazor app, we're gonna be passing in a user and a message um, uh, parameter. 
and we're going to use those two. The user one we're going to use to determine which servo uh, we're going to be driving, and the message is going to be the angle we're going to move to. Um, this is sort of uh, butchered code from a chat app. Um, that, that's where this has come from, so user and message. Uh, and I could have renamed these, obviously, but um, I didn't see the need because it sort of explains, you can imagine, a chat app where the user would have a message that they send. So it kind of makes sense to, to do that. Um, and then we've got a while loop down here that does nothing. And that's because this will carry on running uh, in the back. Once we start that connection uh, in the background, this, this, uh, will, this handler here will just carry on running. So we can just sit there and, and while true forever. I mean, I could put all sorts of different ways of doing that, I guess, but this works. So it's fine. Uh, and then this finally, and, and a stop again. So that's that. I'm just checking my Slack again. Stretch goal gets Pete, get Pete's robot arm to sign the replies to Kid. Yeah, wow, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a um, uh, internal thing that I shouldn't leak out into Twitch. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> anyway. anyway. Um, Right, so back here again, that's an explanation about how that all works. But that that is that piece of code finished. That is essentially our robot arm pi code done. <laughs> There's not much more to it. Um, we get uh, which servo and what angle as a message. And then I use these if-elses here. Interestingly, um, and I mean, I don't class myself as sort of the, the best uh like exactly right programmer in the world but i saw someone tweet that you shouldn't use if else statements at all um because it's a code smell which uh, sort of baffled me because i use loads of them <laughs> so maybe i've got really smelly code i'm not sure but uh don't judge me if, if you're one of those people that says if, if else statements are bad uh, i kind of prefer them in some ways for this sort of stuff to a switch just i don't know just feels like switch is a bit of an over engineering but i'm pretty sure switch compiles down to if else anyway does it i don't know <clears throat> either way i'll make sure that's saved which it has and if you see at the bottom of this now the next step is to create a blazer app so we will do that but we will do that on our machine here on my pc so i've created created a directory here and what we're going to do is do i'm just going to do .net dash dash info and just see this this pc has been used to develop all sorts of different things including uh, .NET Core and different versions of .NET Core. Uh, and see, I've only got 5.0.0 .NET 5 on here. Um, doesn't really make any odds for what we're doing here. It's perfectly fine. Uh, the, the 100 SDK is installed, so that's perfectly fine. Uh, so we're going to do a .NET new Blazor, oh, Blazor Wasm. And then dash dash hosted, we'll, we'll use that. Um, we need the hosted because we need to create the, create the hub. Um, I think there might be a way. I think Liam will probably correct me. There's, there's probably a way we can do that without the hosted side. Uh, but the uh, the tutorial I was following, um, if it gets the job done, yeah, it answers the brief. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> there's only one more. Oh, yeah, well, that's um, the if else thing. I think you're probably commenting on there, isn't it? Either way, um, uh, this is perfectly fine for what I want to do. And I am going to create uh, our RPI robot control. Let create that. So now we're we're back on our own PC here. Now this bit's a little bit more complicated to set up because we've got to set all the signal R stuff up. I think if we do this in Visual Studio, it's slightly faster. But I wanted to stick to code um, because I like code. It's good. So I'm going to open that up in our uh, in code, and you'll see if you've never looked at Blazor Wasm before, a hosted version. You have a client, a server, and then shared uh, stuff. So you can you can share. Um, for instance, in this case of the vanilla one, you share the weather forecast model uh, object rather um, across these three different projects, uh, which is quite handy. Now, see at the bottom right hand corner down here, it's prompting me required assets to build a debugger missing. Do you want to add them? And I'm going to say, yes, I do, because um, built into uh, VS Code is a facility to debug and, and run from here. And we want to run the server. And what that's going to do is create us a launch and a tasks.json. And now that I've done that, I can press F5. And assuming everything's working, we should get a vanilla Blazor app. And that's building in the background, so that's why it's taking a little while. Uh, 
We'll know it's running because this top left hand corner we should get a loading. And wow, doing this uh, while using, uh, by the way, um, while it's doing this, might as well explain. I've got two PCs doing this streaming. Um, I've got one PC that um, you can see that I'm doing all of the coding on, but that's that's got OBS running with an NDI link to a second PC that's doing the streaming side, uh, which is by far the best way of doing it because this this um, PC, the, the one that's doing all the hard work actually, um, is under a lot of pressure at the moment and even the mouse cursor is, is locking up. And had I streamed everything from that one PC, then I would also be locking up. But I'm hoping that um, for the most part, I'm, I'm in sync and not jerky and, and all of those things down here. Um, so that's taking its time. Let me just switch back. See, oh, it's really slowing down. So it is actually running, but it's just being slow. The whole PC is grinding to a halt. I'm not quite sure what it's doing. Come on now. I'm going to have a look. A task manager. It's not usually that slow, to be perfectly fair. Oh, and it, it stopped, I think. It got so bogged down with whatever it was trying to do. I was having a look at my task manager now to see. Visual Studio was what it was complaining about, so I'm not entirely sure what its problem there was, so I'm going to run F5 again. I've had that happen, and it, um, uh, and it just crashes. Oh, here we are. Look, so this is what I was expecting it to do earlier. Loading, and there we are. So that's um, a vanilla Blazor Wasm, a hosted Blazor Wasm app. Um, uh, if you ever want to be able to be offline, you need the hosted, hosted option. Yeah, for, for Wasm. Um, although, I think, isn't the server side still on the server, but the Wasm side will carry on running on, on your machine, of course. Uh, so you probably don't even need the hosted part for that. But if you need an API or anything, uh, then the, the server side will give you that as well. Um and then, the, yeah, the alternative is Blazor Server rather than Blazor Wasm. But that, as specifically as Everoth is talking about there, will mean that um, you won't have uh, any on offline capabilities. So, uh, yeah, I, I knew exactly what you meant, Everoth. Don't worry. It's all good. Uh, so, yeah, we've got uh, that working. Now, I mean, you can actually spin this whole app up on the, uh, on the Pi. And the Pi runs this fantastically well, actually, certainly on Raspberry Pi 4. Um, but if I'd have run this all on the Pi, you'd have shouted foul at me. Um, so I really wanted to run this on a different machine. Um, and yeah, that counter and everything, that works. And that's fetching data from that API. So that all appears to be working. So that's good. So if I switch back to here and then stop it from debugging. And stop that. We have a whole heap of things that we now need to do. So... I'm going to switch back here. So we created the app, and what we want to do is add this um, signal our client to our client application. So I'm going to do that in the command prompt. So I'm just in the RPI robot control directory here. Let me just zoom in a little bit more again, uh, just so I make sure that you can see what I'm doing. Yeah, so uh, it might be even better for, for, for everyone now, I, I imagine. So... I'm going to add to the client project. If you remember, there was three three projects in their shared client to server. Uh, that uh, signalr.client nuget package. So that's done. And then I'm also going to add something called Matt Blazor. If you've not seen Matt Blazor before, it's a, a free set of uh, Blazor components. It's really good, actually. There's some really cool things in there, like checkboxes and file uploads. Liam, file upload, file upload, uh, and select. And uh, what we're going to be doing is adding a slider, actually. Uh, if I could click on it, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'm not sure what this is doing. Oh, it is doing it, Matt Slider. So you can sort of see it's got an example of what that looks like uh, across the top there. So I'm going to be adding one of those to, to our application. I think it's going to look a little bit like that. Uh, so let's add that in. Um, so that's, that's, that's fine. That's what we needed to do there. And we've already opened it in code. So I don't need to do that step. And this is the part here where I was adding in the, um, uh, then the wherewithal that we needed to be able to do remote, um, but to, to do, um, uh, the, the debugging and running from VS code. 
We already saw that worked. You can actually do it from the terminal if you like. You can run it using that command there, but why? <laughs> Just don't bother. I suppose if you've not got VS Code, then maybe. And we opened it up. So now, adding the Blazor controls. Once once we've added those NuGet packages, that doesn't give you everything you need. There's a bunch of stuff we need to do. So um, one of them is that we need to use add this using statement so we get access to that Matt Blazor uh gubbins that we added earlier so we're in robot control so that was in client and then imports.razor and we can let, ooh, add that to the bottom of there let's copy that shall we add that one uh, and i mean uh i've, I've done s uh, some blazer i've made some 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 apps for clients and stuff but i've not spent a long time digging into some of the the depths of how this works uh, you, if you want that level, then you need to talk to, to Chris Sainty or John Hilton or, or somebody like that who, you know, experts at it. Um, I kind of just um, make it work and then stop. and don't need to worry too much unless it doesn't work. So that's good. Uh, so then we need to open this index and we need to include these, uh, the JS and the CSS for, for Matt Blazer in there as well. And that's in this WW root and index. And then we need to add those just at the bottom of that. And then we now need to enable access to the server app from any machine on our network. And we do that using this launch, launch settings.json file. Obviously, as I've said, we're running the SignalR app on our PC, but the Raspberry Pi is going to need to connect to the SignalR service, uh, which is essentially just a URL. Uh, so um, we need to do that in what? Um, server launch settings, which is what? Where was that? Server... Uh, why is that not there? Is it there somewhere? Oh, is it app settings, not launch settings? No. Where is it? Oh, it's in properties. And more pull requests, please. That should say server properties launch settings. That's going to confuse somebody. Uh, and this is the line we want to overwrite. There's actually two lots of uh, application URLs. Uh, and that's IIS, so we, we don't need to worry about that. So we can just... So we're just replacing that with zero 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 zero, which is just access from any. It's the same as having a star in uh, square brackets, I think. So we can save that. And you see what I mean? There's quite a few steps here. It's like set up to get this to work. Um, so don't worry too much about what it is. Just sort of follow the steps and, and get that to work. Uh, but now we can add the markup um, to, to create the signal R hub and, and, the, and the sliders, the map blazer sliders. So we can open the, the main index dot razor file back in the client in pages and index.razor and see there's not much in that vanilla page and if you remember all it did say was hello world and there was this survey prompt uh, component that they've added there so actually going to get rid of all of that aside from the page and then i am going to add some using statements to add signal r and a navigation manager and uh, make it disposable because we can dispose of our signal R connection later. That's why we need that. And then we can add some code to get the sliders on the page. And I'll talk about what they do. So I'm not going to talk about HTML, but what we've got here is a couple of mat sliders and I've bound it to this servo one property that I'm going to add in a bit. And I've set this immediate true. So what that's doing is if you don't set that immediate true, when you move the slider, and take your, your, your finger off the mouse button, it'll update the value then. If you leave immediate true on, or set it on, it will constantly update that property. Uh, so we can move that slider and see the arm moving. Otherwise, they'll have to move the slider and let go and the arm and move, which isn't ideal. Uh, then we've got the step, and I originally had this at 10 because, you know, I did, but it works really well at 1. So that's what we're going to be doing is using these sliders to move between uh well zero and 180 essentially but we just don't um uh all oh, azure live starting now until the end of the show if you want to win one of these brilliant t-shirts uh subscribe to the channel and put uh bang giveaway or uh, exclamation mark giveaway in the chat and we'll draw a winner at the end of the show Woo well i mean that's fantastic go and do that uh because these are actually i mean um I've ordered t-shirts before and this this section here has just been like a stick-on thing that someone's had an iron on. Uh, but these are properly made, so this is properly baked onto this t-shirt. It's really well made. Um, nice t-shirts. Oh, look at that! Johnny Chip subscribed at Tier 1. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's very good of you. 
Uh, so where do I get to? Uh, steps. Yeah, and then enable steps, obviously. And then we can set the minimum and the maximum. And look, we're using 0 and 180. Really, probably 10 and 170 would be safer in this. And then I've left the markers on. Remember I mentioned about those little markers? Uh, and then uh, pin is true, and that, that's just pinning where it is. And then uh, some other stuff that we don't need to worry about. Uh, and there's two of them, one for each servo. Um, but you see the squiggly lines under there at the moment uh, because uh, we've not got the properties. The name survey does not exist. And that's some of the stuff that we need to add in this add control code section. So um, we need to create the signal R hub though first in the server project. So is that right? Must not, not skipped a step, has it? No, that's the controls. Add control code. Oh, that's oh, it's all here. It's all there. It's is that that's what it all is. Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, confused myself. I, this is one of the things I was kind of faffing with before we started. So um, we need to create a new directory in the server project called hubs. So we can do that. So let me just minimize this lot, make it easier. Server. Let's create a new folder called hubs. This is kind of convention. And then within there, we need to create a new file, chathub.cs. And within there, we can have some code. And this is somebody else's code, uh, but it's just giving us a send message function that we can we can use. And then we just wait for a receive message back. If, uh, if we do something with it, then you know, if we receive it, then that's what we get, I think. Uh, not pay too much attention to that because it just works. You know, just leave it there and, and it's fine. So uh, now we need to add the SignalR service to our server app. So we need to open the startup.cs and add the following in the using section. So startup.cs, where was that? There. And we've got a bunch of services that we add down here. I think. Oh, no, in, uh, just here, configure the services. And I stick that in the middle. Oh, no, that's just the wrong thing. Look. This. Oh, the using section first. Uh. Pay attention to your own code, Pete. Your own instructions. Then we can add the services to the configure services part. Just hit, and then uh, then that's that. So we uh, oh, no endpoint endpoint endpoint. Don't forget that. So this is going to give us that chat chat hub endpoint down here. So we use endpoint section. I can stick that in there, and then if you hit that chat hub, then it'll connect to the chat hub. Um, that we created up here, that one there. So that's what that's going to do for us in the server. So now we can go back to our index.razor and we can get rid of these squigglies. Uh, by the way, obviously, if if I've gone too fast or I've not explained something properly or if I've something something wrong, uh, then definitely then put it in the chat and tell me because uh, the last thing I want to do is to be talking rubbish and somebody on the, in the chat there be able to tell me if I'm doing that. So... Um, yeah, by subscribing, you get a badge and get to skip ads as well and that sort of stuff. Yeah, okay. I always wondered what subscribing gave you, so that's cool. And thanks again, Johnny. So um, at the moment, of course, as you're the only one that's done that, uh, then you're pretty much guaranteed uh, to get a T-shirt. So woohoo, uh, worth it just from that respect. So how much is it to subscribe these days? Is it like, a, is, a, is there a cost or do you get some some coins that you get to use or or what? Uh, I don't know how that works. It shows that I've never subscribed to somebody before, doesn't it? Which is pretty bad because there are some awesome streamers. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm completely a rank am amateur at this. The stuff that Liam does, I mentioned earlier, is absolutely fantastic. Some other people as well, uh, Layla, and I know Johnny, you you stream there as well. And um, uh, I'm not sure if there's anybody else in here that I follow. Does that ever off? Do you stream? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, Layla Porter and Jeff Fritz and people like that, um, uh, fantastic. Go and go and follow those on, on Twitch as well. Uh, so um, now we need to create the code section to be able to house the code for our page. Do that, and then we can create a couple of backing uh, internal backing variables here for our servos, and this is just going to keep a hold of the angle that our slider is um, being moved to. And we can also create a hub connection because we need to connect our uh, application to the hub that's running on the server. And then some code. I mean, these are just the properties 
for those two variables are created up there. There we are. And so it just gets that server one variable. And what it does when it's set is that we set that our state has changed and then we send uh, £4.99 even. Oh, that's not too bad then. Yeah. <coughs> that's quite good. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we call into this hub connection that we've got up there and we send this async message, send message, and this survey one or send survey one, and it just converts that variable uh, that, that we're, we're binding there. Uh, to a string and sends that as well and so you'll see these squigglies have gone now because uh, we've bound that to those properties now when you move the slider as we've got that uh, immediate true it'll just automatically update that property which will update the backing variable and also send that uh, message to the to the hub uh, which will then broadcast it as it happens <clears throat> and uh, it's like a, a massive stretch goal is that it'd be really cool to get loads of people to to build this project and then we we deploy this uh, web app to Azure and then I do that moving in Azure and then everybody's robot arm moves in synchrony that'd be <laughs> I think that'd be pretty cool it'd also be freaky uh, but yeah get get going and <laughs> give that I couldn't find the option to add in my prime but we'll subscribe next month uh, okay cool MS how to live oh geez absolutely oh Mert I'm really sorry uh, definitely Mert's probably not even watching anymore he's sick of it he's gone um, Mert, some of the stuff that Mert does on there is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it is Mert that does MS How To Live, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Oh, anyway, apologies. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so we've created the properties. The next thing we need to do is we need to override this init uh, uninitialized async to be able to create our hub connection. Put me on Twitter, Johnny. Uh, Johnny Twitter. Yeah, go ahead, do that. <coughs> Uh, I thought I'd be about an hour doing this, but it looks like I'm an hour and a half already. But to be fair, we're not that far off, so stick with me. Uh, we're not going to be that much longer now. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're just initialising our hub connection. We're going to um, pass in forward slash chat hub, which is going to bind onto that, that that URI that we, we mapped earlier. And then we're going to build that connection and then start the connection out to the signal R hub. When, when I was writing the instructions, I kept putting IoT hub. You probably know that IoT is my my thing so iot hubs is the first thing if there's any hub it's an iot hub and um, so i had to keep correcting myself in the instructions <coughs> so next thing we need to do is uh, uh, remember whether or not we're connected actually we don't use this uh, but it's good for you to see that it's there because you can then bind this is connected out onto the and we should really um i'm here Mert is here hey there we are happy days you know um this, uh, I've got the chat popped out and it's tiny and that thumbs up looks like a uh, a, uh, a poo emoji. <laughs> so, I thought, that's a bit rude. What, what do you not like, Mert? <laughs> I'm very rude. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, so we, we can bind onto this on our controls and disable them, which is what we should be doing. Uh, but I'm not because, you know, flying by the seat in my pants. So that's good. We've done that bit. Uh, and next, all we need to do is cover the fact that we need to dispose it because we've um, uh, used this iSync disposable. We've implemented that. We must obviously implement the iSync disposable stuff. So that's what this is. And it's good to do that because we can then close that uh, hub connection down and not leave it dangling. So, so that's good. So theoretically, you know, that's the end of that bit and the next part is the very last part configure and run um but if you remember if i flick back to my robot code we're still needing this ip address now i happen to know what it is but what you need to do is spin up uh and i'm not going to do this because it's going to give away my ipv6 address which is not something you should do on a on a stream um but i've done this earlier and it just so happens that i know what my address is and i've put it here 192.168.1.162 and that's what it looks like if you do an IP config. And obviously, if you've got a Mac, and there's no reason why you can't do all of what I've been doing today on a Mac. Uh, this will work on a Mac too. Uh, VS Code is cross-plat. .NET 5 is cross-plat. Um, you've got your own terminal instead of putty. You can just use that. <coughs> um, and I'm pretty sure you can you can use some form of file sharing to do Samba and stuff like that. So um, I'm pretty sure that's fine. So we need to, we need to, to grab that, and we need to fill in... Um, the, the IP address back in our robot. So I'm going to do that. 
And that's the last bit of coding we need to do. Obviously, I'm hoping this is all just going to work now because otherwise I'm into debugging live and that would be a sad thing to have to do right at the very end. <clears throat> and now we can run the, the Blazor app. I'm just going to close all of this lot. And all of that lot. And then I'm going to hit F5. And all being well, we'll just get an app starting. You've got to do it this way round. You've got to create the hub first and then allow your, your Raspberry Pi to connect to it because I haven't written any reconnection logic in there. So if I was to start the Pi up first, it would try and connect to the hub and go, it's not there, and then just give up, uh, which isn't ideal. Loading. So that's a good start. And we've got two servos shown on the screen. That's also a good start. I also don't have an error at the bottom, so that's more good starts. Flick back into here, and I don't see any errors in the in the terminal window either, so that looks good too. So let's go and start our robot code over here. .NET run. And I will switch to this mode. Something like that. That might be easier to see. I can hear that it's doing something because I don't know if I... I don't know if you can hear that. It's buzzing. And that, that was that buzzing that I was telling you about earlier. So um, you kind of you kind of know that it's doing something if you've done that. So I'm going to move this... Um, I'm going to try and put these two windows side by side, actually, so that you can see what it's doing. So not that one. I've already allowed this through the firewall, so um, I mentioned earlier, just here, you're likely to get this firewall access um, permission. So just hit allow access on that and, and you're up and running. So if I get this and just make this a bit smaller and zoom out. There we go. Uh, that should be about right now. All being well. Oh, but you can't see what I'm doing. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's um, what I've done is um, <clears throat> I've just put these two windows side by side. So now I've got my uh, robot control app, and on the left hand side I've got my putty session, my terminal session. <clears throat> Excuse me. And all being well, if I move these servos, you should be able to see. That's the pincer on servo one. And that, that's moving in one... And, and I'm sorry about the, the, the jerkiness of the stream under those circumstances, but you should be able to see that that's sort of um, smoothly going forwards and backwards. It is in real life that's going smoothly forwards and backwards. But I can I can click and it goes in a jump. And likewise, I can move the arm... forwards and backwards. And so if I switch back to this window here, then you can sort of, you won't see, and oh, actually if I do this, oh, no hit, then you should be able to see what it's doing. So if I move these two, top right hand side, you should be able to just about see that moving the, the pincers in and out. And then if I move this, then you should be able to see the robot arm moving in and out. Looks a bit demented. <laughs> but I mean, uh, that's that's essentially the, the end of that particular stream. So um, we've we've been through getting the Pi set up and getting .NET 5 installed and Hello World and then the IoT version of Hello World by flashing an LED. And then we had a button we could press. Uh, and then we'd hooked up the servos to it and we we're able to run through some just some demo code to make the servos move in a loop. Uh, then we spun up a Blazor app, Blazor, um, a hosted Blazor Wasm app, and we added all of the necessary SignalR stuff to that, as well as that Map Blazor set of controls. And then we we pasted in some some code to to allow us to to show those sliders on there. And then we built up the code to to take the values of those sliders and send them out through that SignalR connection back down onto our Pi. So um, I mean. That that is pretty much it. I mean, does does uh, anybody have any any questions at that point? Is there anything that you want to put in the chat, or is there anything you want to see? And I mean, it's five past seven now, so I, I thought I'd be about an hour, an hour and a half. So I've, I've been an hour and a half. Not bad, 
Really? Not bad. I mean, I did waffle at the start, and we did have some some interruptions and stuff. Um, I mean, obviously, there's no good me trying to do this format for uh, DDD because I think we've got 45 minutes. So uh, that's like two sessions. Uh, somebody after me would get very annoyed. Uh, and again, if you've not bought your DDD tickets, that's on uh, Saturday the 12th of December. It's an all-day free event. The, the, the tickets are on in, on Eventbrite. Um, any more? Um, did anybody else subscribe? I mean, now's your time. If you want a chance of winning one of these beautiful T-shirts, then now's your time. Go and, go and spend a fiver and get a T-shirt, or at least a chance to get a T-shirt. Uh, DDD is also part of DDD. It is it. I didn't realise that, Greg. It's part of the Festive Tech Calendar. Oh, interesting. Well, that's awesome, man. So I'm actually in the festive tech calendar three times. Then. <laughs> awesome. I like that. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, Use.net on uh, the awesome Pete. Definitely going to give it a go building this news.net on the pie. Definitely. And you know where I am on Twitter. It's uh, at Pete underscore codes. Um, um, I'll tweet out the, the links to the GitHub repo. Um we know there's a couple of errors in there. Um, I'm half tempted to leave them there and then let people make pull requests. Uh, but, you know, that would be a bit rude. Um, maybe. I don't know. But I can't remember where they were now. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for organising this. Um, it's fantastic. And yeah, any time, it's been a privilege to take part in this. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I, I really do hope you've enjoyed this. Um I've I've had a good I've had good fun and it. it's really nice to do this while actual people are watching. So, <laughs> um, obviously, if you're watching this back, then you're going to have the facility to be able to pause this at places and and catch up later. Um, uh, for the most part, I think it, it's just going to work. Um, absolutely, as as uh, Jonathan says, uh, thank you for all your work there, Jonathan. It's obviously not just Jonathan. There's, uh, it's not just Greg or Greg. There's an entire team of people that have been organising this, but. Uh, Greg has been at the forefront of, of that organisational stuff. So um, thank you, Johnny. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think that actually went quite well for saying that I've practised it through once at a pace earlier, you know, uh, minutes after I'd finished creating it. Um, so if the, I mean, if there's no more questions, uh, then... Uh, oh, the giveaway. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. Don't, be, don't let me leave before that happens. Johnny Chips. What a surprise. Thank you very much for uh, uh, for subscribing there, uh, Johnny. It's that's awesome. And uh, if you've not if you've not seen um, Johnny's rig and by that, I mean, his computer rig there that he's got. It's fantastic. This setup is awesome that he's got there. So, I mean, this is just going to make you look even cooler. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, congratulations! Uh, thank you again. Keep keep tuned on the twelfth, obviously, for for some more uh, Azureish stuff and for a more sort of produced version of this talk. But uh, there's obviously going to be another door opening um, to to announce uh, some stuff happening tomorrow. Uh, so so keep your eyes on Twitter and uh, and YouTube and stuff like that for for those um, announcements. And this has been fantastic and. Thank you so much for coming along and I'll I'll see you all again soon. See you later.